In 2013, University of Chicago professor Harold Pollack found himself in the national headlines for one really small idea. It couldn't get any simpler. All the financial advice you really need might just fit on a four by six index card. The idea came to Pollock after he mentioned in an interview with journalist Lane Olin that he could jot down everything anyone needs to know about finance on a small card. Then people dared him to do it. So Pollock put 10 items on an index card, took a snapshot and posted it online. It promptly went viral. The index card was a hit. It was featured in the Washington Post, Forbes, and NPR. And thus was born Pollock and Olin's short new book, The Index Card, A Few Simple Rules. And Pollock has a theory about why people took so readily to his tiny idea. I think we're all both terrified and intimidated by all of the things that we have to do to save for our retirement. You know, if you turn on financial TV and it's like, you know, President Trump's in a tiff with China and the stock market is doing some crazy thing and maybe I should be buying more bonds, maybe I should be buying more stocks, what do I think about Bitcoin? And it's incredibly intimidating. That's Pollock. The genius of the card was in its simplicity. In a world with so much noise and confusion, Clear, coherent ideas seem to cut through the clutter. And what a lot of people seem to be hungry for is something that is comprehensible that basically puts, pushes them in a common sense direction. And I think that's why my incredibly not original uh, set of tips that I put on this index card seem to be helpful to people. That search for common sense answers to complicated questions has driven Pollock's work beyond finances as he's conducted research on two of the most complex issues our society has tried to fix, crime and healthcare. What folks have shown is, yeah, there's a lot about this environment that is really hard, but here are some interventions that really do reduce crime among young people, reduce violence, make people healthier. From the University of Chicago, this is Big Brains, a podcast about the stories behind the breakthroughs that are reshaping our world. On this episode, Harold Pollock's straightforward advice to tackle finances, crime, and healthcare. I'm your host, Paul Rand. We'll start with the story behind a little card that started it all. So I was a professor at the University of Michigan, and then I was recruited to the University of Chicago. Four months after we arrived, my, my mother-in-law died suddenly, very tragically, and my wife's brother, Vincent, who was living with my mother-in-law, had to, you know, he, mo he moved into our house. And he moved in, he was 340 pounds, he has an IQ in the 50s, he has something called Fragile X Syndrome. And it was a profound challenge for us if you had to bear the entire cost of taking care of a person with a profound disability, it would bankrupt you. Mm. I remember that when he moved in, because he was so large, we had to buy some new furniture so he could sit in comfortably. And I remember one day uh, we bought a Lazy Boy chair and it was like $950 or something like that. And I just remember thinking in a very matter-of-fact way, you know, I will just hemorrhage my money. And suddenly I'm like, wow, I have to totally change the way I live. And so I, you know, I had the skills of a professor of public policy, but I'd never really directed them towards personal finance. So I start watching TV and I start reading books and I see very quickly that the expert conversation about saving and investing is so much simpler than, than the sort of world of self-help and financial cable TV and all of that. And in fact, a lot of the advice that was on that you'd get from the personal finance industry was actually fairly toxic. Right. And so I started joking to people, you know, you know, the problem that this industry has is that the best advice for most people is available for free in the library and you could basically jot it down on an index card. And, and one day I had a blog and one day I interviewed Helene Olin, who's a personal finance writer, and I made this joke to her while we were talking about her book. And then people started emailing and saying, well, kind of where's the index card? And so I figured, well, you know, people are – Asking for it, I better do it. So I reached into the drawer. I pulled out one of my daughter's four by six index cards, and I just scribbled with a with a pen nine things on an index card. And I took a picture of it with my iPhone, and I posted it, and it got like four hundred thousand hits. And it was that simplicity of it that people really seemed to value. And uh, you know, there's nothing on there that it, you know represents an original research contribution that I've made. It's all things that are 
quite obvious to people who teach who teach finance over at Booth, but there are things that are not obvious to a lot of people. It's funny. Uh, it won uh, Money Magazine's best new idea of the year, okay. 2014. <laughs> and I, and so my colleagues at the Booth School, you know, who really do this stuff yes. for real, they were like looking at it and they were like, you're kidding. The ideas on Pollock's index card, which is easy to find with a quick Google search, are straightforward. Max out your 401k, save 20% of your income, pay your credit card balance in full every month. But it streamlines something that many people find too complicated. Now, Pollock has taken that same approach to tackling a whole other problem, crime. In 2008, he co-founded the University of Chicago's Crime Lab, a part of the UChicago Urban Labs. I would say the mission of the Urban Labs is to give people a sense of evidence-based optimism that that we have feasible, realistic interventions that can genuinely help people. Evidence-based optimism. That's a cool phraseology. Yeah. And if you look at, say, the crime lab, everyone in Chicago, it doesn't matter where you are in politics, everyone is sad and really concerned about the violence problem. You know, it's just all around us. Right. But the, the causes of it are so deep and they're and they're so they're they're so profound and poignant that we can easily become very pessimistic and therefore passive about opportunities in the here and now to really make a difference. You know, if, if what we have to do to reduce violence is get rid of all of the negative messages in popular culture that reach young people or get rid of poverty and discrimination and racism, those things are all important. But wow, you know, I don't have a plan for how to get rid of those things in the near term. And it's easy to become uh, discouraged by the scale of the challenge and to say, you know, historically, Chicago has spent a century getting ourselves into this mess and, uh, and, to, and to sort of throw up our hands. And I think what the work of, of Jens and Rosanna Ander and all the people at the crime lab, what folks have shown is, yeah, there's a lot about this environment that is really hard. But here are some interventions that really do reduce crime among young people, reduce violence, make people healthier, make it more likely that a young person will graduate from high school. Uh, you know, there's violence prevention interventions like becoming a man that's right. gotten a lot of attention. There's also small group tutoring. There's a whole variety of things that can really help. The interventions the crime lab has developed all stem from Pollock's view that sometimes simple solutions can actually answer the most complex questions. Like, why does one person fall into crime while another does not? Or what can be done to reduce our prison population? The answers to those questions after the break. Capitalism is the engine of prosperity. Actually, it sows the seeds of its own demise. Could both be right? I'm Kate Waldai from Georgetown University. And I'm Luigi Zingales from the University of Chicago. We're the hosts of Capitalism, a podcast about what's working in capitalism today. And most importantly, what isn't. We're going to share the sort of irreverent banter you'd hear between economists at a bar. That is, if economists were to go to a bar. Subscribe to Capitalism. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Pollock has worked with the Crime Lab to uncover some inexpensive crime interventions that have shown incredible results. For example, in New York, the Crime Lab managed to help reduce the number of people who end up in jail for failing to appear in court by 32%. How'd they do it? By simply redesigning the summons form to make relevant information stand out in bold text and by sending text message reminders. In Chicago, their program, Choose to Change, has showed that if you engage youth who are at risk of committing a violent crime with cognitive behavioral therapy mentorships, you can dramatically decrease arrests. A lot of the interventions that we work on, uh, so becoming a man, for example, you know, it's a pretty simple intervention. It's a once a week group intervention with young people. Very often we're asked, wouldn't it be better if there was a family component? Wouldn't it be better if there was more counseling? And I sort of say, yeah, it would be better. But it, we have tens of thousands of kids who need services in Chicago. And if I make it a really expensive and complex thing, I can't reach all the people that need help. So back to the simplicity idea of making so, this work. So simplicity is so critical. And part of simplicity is is economy, you know, that we're in a resource-constrained environment. You know, if I have an intervention that costs $30,000 per kid and I bring them down to the University of Chicago Department of Psychiatry and give them a fantastic intervention, wow. Uh, for I one can, kid. I can do that for – there. there are some people who have sufficiently profound issues that that intervention might well be cost-effective – 
but wow, that's going to be a small group because we just can't we can't do that on a big scale. Right. So so that's so that's one thing that we look for. We also look for things that that we think would give uh, generalizable lessons to other places and that build an infrastructure that can be generative for other things that we want to do. I'm very interested in understanding how we can use the 911 system to create a data uh, resource so that not only can we respond more safely when, when there's a 911 call, but we can identify people so before there's a 911 call, we can go out and try to help them. So we look for things that create an infrastructure so that they're generative of other things that we want to do. And we also look for things that have scientific credibility. It is remarkable when you can do a rigorous scientific trial, ideally a randomized trial. You can't always do that, but often you can. It is amazing how people respond to that. When you say, here's the treatment group of kids, and here's the control group of kids, and here's the difference in outcome, funders, citizens, they everybody, respond. they respond to that in a way that nothing else quite has the same impact. And, uh, and Why do you think that is? Just because they can see the, the uh, role and the impact of what the work is doing, and it's tangible to them? I think it's tangible, it's rigorous, it's, it's more transparent, or at least it seems that way. Uh, to people. And, you know, every, if you're, say, a big foundation in Chicago, you are inundated with wonderful people who are very passionate about the interventions that they want you to support. And they will come into your, uh, you know, your big conference room and you'll be sitting around a coffee table and they will have someone who has an amazing human story who benefited from that. And that's, that's your appointment from 10 to 11. And then from 11 to 12, there's the next organization that comes in with their intervention. Story, right. and, and you're saying, who, who, who am I going to support? I can't support everybody. And when someone comes in and says, I have a rigorous scientific trial, and here's what we found, funders say, wow, that gives me a tool that is very helpful. Now, there's a lot of challenges one can make to this perspective, and there's a lot of limitations in this approach, but you can't do a randomized trial of a lot of things, and a randomized trial has its own limitations. But that rigor is very valuable, and I think the world is increasingly demanding both the rigorous randomized trial and also not only the trial. Now they're even gone a step beyond that. They're saying, I want your trial to be designed in a way that you can explain to us what the mechanisms were that made this intervention successful and for which people. The world is demanding a higher and higher standard of careful implementation and documentation and, and real scientific depth. And I think that is that makes me very encouraged that the marketplace and public policy and philanthropy is really asking us to raise our game and to really show that what, we, what we're doing is working and to really be able to explain why it's working. If you're listening to Big Brains, there's a good chance you consider yourself a lifelong learner. However, you may not know about the University of Chicago's Graham School and its focus on continuing liberal and professional studies. For more than a century, Graham has been a destination for lifelong learners. They offer courses online and in the classroom, bringing the transformative education you Chicago is known for to students of all ages. To learn more about the courses, certificates, and degrees, visit graham.uchicago.edu. Remember Pollock's index card, item number nine, the last item on the list? That caused the most controversy among financial experts. It says, promote social insurance programs to help people when things go wrong. This last piece of advice has been a driving force in all of Pollock's work. I do think that there's a basic sense in America that we have to take care of each other. Is that uh, increasing or decreasing, or you think it's just inherent and it's staying the same? Well, I think there's a battle that's going on about that. In some ways, I think we have been forced to confront these questions in a very basic way because the society is changing so dramatically. It's changing geographically as we see tremendous inequalities between the wealthy coastal cities and some of the rural areas. We're changing demographically as uh, you know, the population of younger people is much more substantially non-white than the population of older people. Mm -hmm. And this has caused, uh, you know, tremendous uh, social tension. We're challenged because th the rising cost of health care is just a profound burden on the economy. Just like finances and crime, Pollock sees the cost of our health care as an issue that's both central to people's lives and too complex for them to control. 
And as a member of the Center for Health Administration Studies at UChicago, he's working to find ways to better understand and improve it. But things aren't always so easy when you're trying to tackle what's been famously called one of the most complicated issues in America. If you look out to 2030, 2040, 2050, we have a big problem. And we have, problem, we have a problem with long-term care. We have a problem with Medicare costs. We have a problem of how we're going to finance pharmaceutical innovation without tremendously increasing costs. And we have to somehow have a more disciplined healthcare system. All technological advances creating more and more opportunities to save lives and spend money. Absolutely. And we're doing all of those things. I think across the political spectrum, we really don't want to face that issue with the seriousness that it that it deserves. And I think for I think conservatives have to face the fact that that greater government control over prices is probably essential to discipline the healthcare system. And we're going to eventually do that. And if conservatives want to uh, ensure that the that the market mechanisms that have tremendous value are part of that process. Uh, they have to figure out ways to to combine those things. And progressives also have to have to acknowledge that. I think if you believe in things like the single payer system, you have to think of a way that we can raise substantially greater government revenues in a way that that would not damage the economy. In regards to health care and, and mm-hmm. single payer, especially given the clear, current political environment, where are some of your thoughts going? What, what, what's getting better? What's getting worse? What, what's looming? Some things that are getting better. I think that, that ironically, the effort to repeal the Affordable Care Act ratified the public consensus around the idea of universal coverage. That's not the same as single payer, but it is it is What's the difference related between to universal and single payer? So the idea behind universal coverage is that every American should have health insurance that genuinely works if you get really sick. Okay. And that no one should lose their house because they, they get cancer. No one should be charged more money for insurance because they have a pre-existing condition and no one should be denied care for that reason. Now that – one way to achieve that aspiration would be if we had sort of Medicare for all, single payer system. That's only one way to do it. If you look at uh, the countries of Western Europe that have universal coverage, some of them are like England or Canada where they really have a single payer system, but some of them are more like the Netherlands or Switzerland or Germany where they have things that look a little bit more like the Affordable Care Act's hmm. exchanges. You could have private insurance in the mix. You could have nonprofit insurers in the mix. You don't necessarily have to have uh, one government payer that does everything, but you do have to have this element where where everyone is protected, people of low income are subsidized, people who are sick are subsidized, and we have some way, some national policy that ensures that everyone is covered and that what and that the coverage is adequate if you really need it. Okay, Th- this is as, as we've watched year after year is not a uncomplicated subject. Can you boil this down and put it on an index card to, to get us so we can uh, move on something here? Well, no, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Many of my friends who favor, say, single payer say, you know, there are all these European countries that have a much simpler healthcare system that is much cheaper than the American system, that is more disciplined, that genuinely covers everyone, and that's basically better than what we have. And in many ways, and what we should do, we should we should enact a system like that that kind of replaces the messy interest group politics and all the pathologies that we have right now in America. And the, and, you know, they're right that a lot of these systems are better than the American system. But the problem is that any kind of single-payer system that we create has to be the product of the very same goofy political system that produced what we have right now. Right, right. So, so we, would, we would have to bake in a lot of the pathologies that we currently have in whatever is kind of achievable. Uh, in, so if we enacted something like a Sanders single-payer style plan. Bernie Sanders. Yeah, Bernie Sanders. Uh, we would – the revenue required to do that, even if we really, really reduced health care expenditures at the national level a lot, we would have to increase federal revenues by something on the order of doubling the federal income tax. And so the, the idea that we're going to jump to that in one uh, fell swoop is – we're just not going to do that. Right. Uh, but I do think that what we've learned over the past several years is that many Americans across the political spectrum 
believe that people should have the option to sign up for Medicare or Medicaid if that's what they want. Okay. That private insurance in many contexts does not work particularly well. I would say that com- the complexities and the all the political wrangling that's always going to be there. We have to figure out how to navigate that successfully in a way that produces a better system than we have now and one that's, that's, that's more humane and disciplined than we have now. Uh, but it's, there's not going to be any simple way to get an index card system that isn't an incredible set of compromises. Wonderful. You've been a terrific guest today. Thank you for all of your thoughts, your comments. We'll look forward to seeing what you continue to work on. Uh, thank you so much. Big Brains is a production of the UChicago Podcast Network. To learn more, visit us at news.uchicago.edu and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.